Good morning, everyone, and welcome back. Today, we'll continue our uh, lesson on learning with operant conditioning. So last class, we talked about classical conditioning, which is a simple form of associative learning. And today, we'll learn about operant conditioning, which is bit more complex. It's behavior that is controlled by its consequences. Basically, if we're rewarded for doing something, we'll do more of it. And if we're punished for it, we'll do less of it. And that's called the law of effect. So operant conditioning is learning. We're in the frequency of a behavior. That's how much you do it, how much the rat pushes the lever is controlled by its consequences. So if you reward the rat with a pellet of food for pushing the lever, it'll push the lever. If you give the rat an electric shock for pushing the lever, it won't want to do that. So the operant conditioning reflects the fact that organisms who act in the world, who make intentional actions, are uh, rewarded or punished for doing so, right? Those actions have helpful or harmful consequences, and an organism uses its awareness of those consequences to adjust its behavior so that it can act more adaptively, get more rewards and, and less punishments. The instrumental behavior, like pushing the lever, is called an operant because doing that gets you something. Similarly, studying is an operant that gets you something that you want, right? Maybe completing this course, um, asking a your crush out on a date, right? That behavior of walking up to them and saying, hey, you know, would, would you like to, to get coffee sometime? That's an operant. And hopefully it'll it'll get you a, a yes and maybe a relationship or maybe it won't. You'll get a rejection and, and then you'll be afraid to do it again. But those instrumental behaviors, those behaviors that you are undertaking because you want to get something out of it, get something good or avoid something bad, is called an, called the operant. So if we're rewarded for doing something, and, and that doing something is a response to a stimulus. There's a stimulus out there in the environment. You go do something to it or with it. If you're rewarded for doing that, then you're more likely to repeat that behavior in the future. And so learning in operant conditioning is about an association between a stimulus and a response. We're at to say the stimulus is the lever and the response is pushing it. Well, what stamps in that connection is the reward. It's getting food for pushing the lever. Right, that food teaches you the association between, or teaches the rat, the association between the lever and the action of pushing it. And this does not require insight, right? The, the rat doesn't have to understand how that works and how the Skinner box is, is set up so that when it pushes uh, the lever, a food pallet is dispensed. Right? It doesn't, doesn't require that higher level understanding. This research started with um, Edward Thorndike, and he put cats in what he called puzzle boxes. And it has to be a hungry cat, otherwise the cat's not motivated, because if you put a cat in a box and it doesn't care, it just like go to sleep, right? So you put a hungry cat in this puzzle box, and it has to do something like, say, pull a string or push on a lever in order to get out of the box and to the food. And what cats will do when they're put in, in this box is, is be active and, and do all kinds of stuff. And maybe eventually they do something like back into the lever that opens the door. But they don't seem to, to figure it out. They're not like, aha, I need to push on this lever. Uh, because if you put them back in the box, they, they'll still spend a, a long time in there doing all sorts of other things that are the wrong thing. 
in order to get out. But if you keep repeating this over and over, um, the cat does get get faster at, at doing this. And that gradual development of, of the response um, suggests that it's a form of, of associative learning and not um, an aha moment of higher level cognition. Also, if they, they understood the mechanism, then they might uh, try more efficient way. So let's say they accidentally backed into the lever, um, then they'll probably end up doing that again and always backing into the lever in order to get out and instead of, say, using their paw. Okay, because that that would, if they knew that or if they realized that, then then that would suggest there was some higher level cognition versus just repeating what happened to work because of trial and error. Now, this wasn't the most efficient setup because you needed a researcher there, uh, you know, with a clipboard watching the cat and, and holding a timer. And you want to go off and do other things while while the cat's squirming around in the, in the box. And so B.F. Skinner uh, came up with the Skinner box. And this is a, a sort of a mechanized box. It's not. It's not a puzzle box where they have to get out, but they have to do something. In this case, the, the classic thing to do is, is push a lever and or, or for a, a pigeon, it would be to peg a disc. And then there's a recording device that um, that monitors them. So you can see when the reinforcers are delivered and when the um, animal is doing the behavior, say pushing the level lever. It records all that so you can leave them in there and, and go away and write some papers. So the, the food pellet is a reinforcer. It's a reinforcer because it strengthens the probability of the target response. So let's say that the target response is pushing a lever. Giving a food pellet is a reinforcer because if you do that when the rat pushes the lever, it makes it more likely to push the lever because it likes the food. Food is a reinforcer and it increases the frequency of the behavior. Praise is a reinforcer if it makes you do whatever I praised you for more often. But if I praise you and, and you don't do more of whatever I was praising you for, then, then it wasn't a reinforcer. So whether something's a reinforcer or a punisher depends on how the organism reacts to it. Does it increase the frequency of the target behavior or does it decrease the frequency? Reinforcement, remember that reinforcement is about increasing the frequency of the target behavior, can be positive or negative. Positive means that we add a stimulus. Okay? And in practice, if you add something or do something and that functions to make the organism increase the behavior, that's because they liked it. That's not why we call it positive. It's not positive because you like it. It's positive because we are adding something. Think about um, schizophrenia. Schizophrenia has positive and negative symptoms. And the positive symptoms of schizophrenia aren't like good. They, they're they having um, hallucinations and delusions and hearing voices. They're they're present, they have presence. And the negative symptoms of schizophrenia are just absence. Like you expect somebody to be talking and moving around, but they're just uh, not saying anything. And maybe they're even catatonic. Okay, it's the absence of behavior. So positive reinforcement means that you give a stimulus and then giving that stimulus functions to increase target behavior and that reflects the fact that um, the organism likes it. And so they're seeking it out. That's not why it's called positive, right? It's called positive because we are adding a stimulus. Negative reinforcement means that we take something away. We take something away and the organism increases the frequency of the desired behavior or does it more quickly. Here's an example, you get in your car and you're not wearing your seatbelt. And there's that seatbelt alarm. It goes bing, 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 bing. And you don't like that. So you put your seatbelt on, right? That gets you to do it more quickly. Or maybe you wouldn't do it at, at all otherwise because 
wearing a seatbelt doesn't feel good, but you don't like um, the sound of that that noise. Okay, like your your um, alarm works that way too when when you're sleeping, and uh, you will you will do something which is getting up in order to turn off the alarm, which you don't like hearing. That's negative reinforcement. We take away a stimulus, and for that to work, for that to function to increase the target behavior, it, it indicates that you didn't like the stimulus. So you don't like the sound of your alarm, that's why you get up to turn it off. What, how else? I'm trying to think of, of other examples of, of negative reinforcement. Okay, um, my, my colleague, um, Steve Noel, is an employment counselor, and he believes that a lot of behavior is actually maintained on a negative reinforcement schedule. And he takes the position that, that most people don't go to work because of positive reinforcement. They don't really like going to work that much. They don't really like the work activity that much. They don't really like their colleagues that much. They don't really like their boss that much. But what keeps them going um, is uh, the fear of, um, let's say, losing. You know what? I realized I just made a mistake. Um, I started talking about the next slide, which is on negative, um, uh, on sort of punishment. Um, no, back up a second. He's actually right. It is negative reinforcement. So they're afraid of, of losing their job, of getting fired. They don't want to get fired. So then they keep going to work. So that's his, that's his idea that going to work is maintained on negative reinforcement. People don't want to, does that make any sense? Is he right? This was a conversation I had yesterday. Um, I feel like as I'm explaining it, I'm feeling a little confused. So, so let me know what you think about that. Anyway, basically negative reinforcement means that we um, increase the frequency of the target behavior by taking away something bad. All right. A punisher is an outcome that weakens the probability of a response. So if you do something and you're punished for it, whatever behavior the punishment was targeting, if it was effective, decreases the frequency of that behavior. A disciplinary action is only a punishment if they decrease the chance of the behavior happening again. So if um, a child is swearing and you send the child to their room and you say, well, that's you're punishing them by sending them to their room because you think they don't like it. No, that's not really what it's about. If they swear less after that, then that was a punishment. But imagine if they sweared more or they didn't really care, then it wouldn't be a punishment. Just like reinforcement, punishment can be um, negative or positive. Positive punishment doesn't mean that they like being punished. That's not what it's about. It's about whether or not you are adding a stimulus or removing a stimulus. So positive reinforcement, <laughs> sorry, involves giving a stimulus. And it's punishment because it functions to decrease the target behavior. So if your cat is scratching the sofa and you yell and you say, bad kitty, which makes a loud noise the cats don't like because they have sensitive hearing, and maybe you squirt them with water, they really don't like water. If that functions to get the cat to scratch the sofa less, Right? If they learn that if they scratch the sofa, they'll get yelled at and, and have water sprayed on them, and so they don't do it anymore, then that was effective positive punishment. But looking at my sofa, I, I don't know if that's that's effective. It, it seems that my cat won't do it in front of me, uh, but maybe my cat knows that when I'm not there, she can just go to town on him. And, and that's an, an issue with 
generalizability, where um, the organism learns that the punishment is conditioned to context. Now, don't jump on the counter when you're around to yell at them. But when you're asleep, you know, they'll walk all over the counters. Negative, sorry, um, the fact that the adding a stimulus decreased the behavior indicates that the organism didn't didn't like it or found it. Oh, sorry, I just noticed a, a comment in the chat. Maybe there's an error. Is this slide supposed to say negative? Yes, it is. I'm sorry. There is an error in the slide. That should say negative punishment. It's because uh, and that happened because I copied the slide over when I was making them so I could keep the, the format. Thank you. That that is an error. Um, the fact that positive punishment um, functioned to decrease the behavior indicates that the animal didn't like it, that the cat didn't like the water or the yelling. But um, that's not really what the word positive is or a negative were about. They're not about whether they like it or not. That That's part of the package. It's about whether you're adding a stimulus or taking a stimulus away. But in practice, um, in positive punishment, they don't like the stimulus. Negative punishment, there's an error on the slide. It should say negative punishment, not negative reinforcement. Negative punishment is about taking away a stimulus. So you take something away from somebody to punish them, therefore they do they do less of that. And um, maybe like paying a fine, being grounded so that you're not allowed to do something that you like. And the fact that 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 works, that taking away something was was punishing in practice means that it was something that the organism liked. Um, I have a question here. So the difference between negative reinforcement and negative punishment is whether you want the behavior to continue or stop. Exactly. You are right on it. So the negative means you're taking something away. Reinforcement means that you're trying to increase the frequency of that behavior. So in practice, um, it's that you took away something that they didn't like. And um, the negative punishment would would try to you're trying to decrease the behavior. And in practice, you're taking away something that they liked. And, and that's why it's punishing. So does punishment work? Yeah, that's why we do it. But it does have have its limitations. Um, the textbook says that the punishment doesn't work as as well as as reinforcement. And I want to kind of qualify that these studies are about child rearing. Like that's what they're kind of talking about. Should you spank the child or should you do something else? So there's there's a context to this. Um, an issue with punishment is that it tells you what not to do, not what to do instead. And so maybe you could just tell people what to do and then reinforce them for that, and then they'd go do it, and you could leave out the punishment side. And punishment uh, does create anxiety. It, it upsets people and animals. Sometimes um, increasing anxiety can decrease performance. and it uh, sometimes it um, doesn't generalize beyond the context of the punishment. So um, I, I realized I, I saw this in action when um, I was up in the night uh, at my parents' place one day, and my mom has this. Uh, she's very proud of how the cats like never jump on the counter. So they just would not dare do that. She has taught them not to do that. And that time I was up in the night, I looked in the kitchen and I saw her cat like all over the place walking back and forth sniffing things sitting down with butt on right the cat had just learned to do that when my mother wasn't watching so sometimes if you you punish somebody for doing something they don't learn not to do it so much as not to do it in front of you when they can get caught and so that can create subversive behavior where they do it you know, when you're not looking or in such a way that you don't find out. Um, it can provide a, a model for aggressive behavior. If you 
punish somebody, like say a child, you might teach them to use punishment as a way of dealing with with issues. The concepts that we learned about with classical conditioning, like acquisition, extinction, spontaneous recovery, stimulus generalization, and stimulus discrimination, all apply in operant conditioning. Uh, there's a difference between stimulus uh, discrimination and discriminative stimulus. Um, if an animal discriminates between stimuli, it means it does not generalize its response. Generalization means that, okay, so let's say you teach the, the rat to push a lever, it might also use the pushing response on other lever-shaped things. Like maybe it could learn to flip a switch because that's sort of similar enough. Discrimination is when that doesn't happen. Okay, so maybe you teach a, a rat to push a lever, but it, it can't figure out some other type of response that, that's too different, like pushing a key or pushing a button, right? It can't can't generalize that. That's stimulus discrimination. Now, a discriminative stimulus is something that signals to an animal that it will be reinforced. It's a, it's a contextual signal. So some, something that uh, researchers will do is teach a rat to push a lever to obtain reinforcement when a light is on. And, and the light being on means that when you push it, you get food. That's a discriminative stimulus. But then let's say that we change the color of the light from green to red. When the red light is on, if you push the lever, you'll get a foot shock. You can teach animals those conditions, right? They can learn to, to discriminate and to push the lever when the green light is on and to not push it when the red light is on. And in that case, the light is called a discriminative stimulus. It's a stimulus that says the context is different now. Reinforcers are um, delivered according to certain patterns. The simplest one is continuous reinforcement, that every time the rat pushes the lever, it gets a reward. Lever press, food pellet. Lever press, food pellet. That's continuous reinforcement. That's not really the way things work in the real world. Sometimes you have to take an action several times before you get what you want. Um, you might have to ask quite a few people out for coffee before you get a date. That's called partial reinforcement. Okay, That's when the, the response is reinforced only some of the time. Partial behaviors that are trained on a partial reinforcement schedule are more resistant to extinction. So if an animal's on a continuous reinforcement schedule, um, push the lever, get a pellet, push the lever, get a pellet, and you stop the reinforcement so that now when it pushes the lever, nothing happens, it, it'll stop pushing the lever pretty quickly. Okay, that's extinction. But when they're on a partial reinforcement schedule, when they weren't being reinforced for every response before, then they'll keep going for longer before they finally stop. Um, there are four different kinds of, of partial reinforcement. Uh, this follows a two by two table. So what are the two different factors that create these, these four different types of partial reinforcement schedules? Well, there's the basis of the reinforcement, okay? You could reinforce the rat for every five lever presses. That's based on the number of responses. Or you could make it about an amount of time, okay? So that if the rat, you, you reinforce the rat for the first lever press in a five minute interval. And now any subsequent lever presses during that interval will not be reinforced. 
But once you get to six minutes and you push again, okay, then you can have a re another reinforcer. So that's not based on the number of responses. Well, you need at least one. It's based on the amount of time. So the basis can be number of re responses or amount of time with one response. Then we can look at the consistency of the response. It can be fixed or variable. You could reinforce the rat for every five responses. So it gets a, gets a food pellet at the fifth lever press and the 10th and the 15th and the 20th and so on. Or you could mess with their heads a little more and say it's on an average of five. That's called a variable reinforcement schedule. So it's an average, it's, re, it's reinforced an average of every five lever presses. And, you know, maybe the first time it's five, but, you know, then it's two, then it's seven, then it's one, then it's 10, then it's three, then it's six, and an average of five. These um, produce, okay, this, these two factors create four different schedules of reinforcement. So a fixed ratio scale is when we deliver the reinforcer after an exact number of responses, okay? Every five lever presses. Or we could make it a little harder for the rat with a variable ratio reinforcement schedule and reinforce them after an average of five responses, okay? That's a variable ratio reinforcement schedule. Now, remember the interval is about time, not the number of responsibles, not the number of responses. So we could reinforce, if we put the rat on a fixed interval schedule, would be reinforced um, for one lever press after every five minutes, exactly. Or you could mess with this pour out a little more and, and make that a, a variable um, interval. Like there's another error there that should say variable interval. I think I, when, I, when I did this slide presentation, I was underslept. Um, so on a variable interval reinforcement schedule, then they would be, the rat would be reinforced for a lever press after an average of five minutes, okay? So take your lever press after five minutes, you get reinforced, but then maybe it presses it again and it gets reinforced because now we're gonna reinforce it after 30 seconds. Uh, and then it's gotta wait 10 minutes. Okay, see how that works? Well, that's a variable interval, not ratio reinforcement schedule. I need to edit these slides. Uh, these different um, reinforcement schedules produce different rates of behavior. The fixed ratio and uh, variable interval provide, you know, pretty consistent responding. Um, in the case of the fixed ratio, you see um, kind of a bit of a, a scalloped response. The ratio schedule that gets them the most frequent rate of responding is variable ratio. That's based on the number of responses and they never know when the reinforcer is going to be coming. So they just they just keep going. Okay? Cuz is it going to be after this press and, and maybe we have a streak where nothing's happening, but it could still be the next one, so let's just go at it. On the fixed interval schedule, we see uh we also see a scalloped uh scalloped graph. But the scalloping is of uh, kind of the, the opposite shape to this one. And so what happens in the fixed interval uh, schedules that say, let's say the animal gets, gets reinforced, well, it's not going to bother to do anything because we're waiting for the five minutes to go. And, oh, the five minutes are already up. Let's go. Let's push the lever now. Okay. And it's been reinforced. And, you know, why push the lever? Let's just wait a while. And, oh, it feels like five minutes is about, about up. And... 
and then we'll push the lever. And this is what might happen to you if you're um, if you have deadlines in a course. The deadlines are fixed. You know when they are. Right? You know when your midterm is going to be. And so, you know, there's this, a bunch of studying that you have to do before the midterm or before the quiz. But, you know, why do it now? Right. You could you could just you know, wait and then, oh, dear, better, better put the responding in. OK. And so you get this kind of leave it to the last minute pattern. Uh, but if the animal's on a, a variable interval schedule, it, it doesn't know that, so it can't do that, and you don't have that leave it till the last minute pattern. What? I have a question for you. Um, I have a couple of, of uh, machines here that are supposed to get you to do an operant. The operant is that you put money into the machine and you get something for the money. Uh, maybe a candy or maybe a toy. So the first one is a, a vending machine. What kind of reinforcement schedule is the vending machine on? Assuming it works. I don't like the Coke machines on, on campus. Is it continuous or is it partial? I don't mean a broken vending machine. Assuming it works. You put your coin in. Is that a continuous reinforcement? Yes. It's continuous because every time you put your money in, you get something. Otherwise, you'd be mad and you'd be complaining to facilities management. So, yes, you, you're all correct. That is a continuous reinforcement schedule. Anytime you put your coin in, you get your gumball. You put your $2 in and, and you get your Coke. Now, what about this machine here? It's one of those arcade games with, with the claw. You get a prize every time you play. Yeah, so it's partial reinforcement because sometimes you you try and and the grippy claw is just too weak and it can't pick up the stuff to you that you, that you want. Um, I felt very I don't know I, I tried these out when and, and and I felt very ripped off. So yes, that is a partial reinforcement schedule. And and then which one would it be? Um, of those those four. Yes, yeah, it's a it's a variable ratio uh, responding schedule, and that's because it's based on your number of responses, but you don't know how many responses, how much money you have to put in the machine before you can finally get the claw to work. And uh, gambling machines, like arcade games and uh, what are those like slot machines, are all based on the variable ratio reinforcement schedule because the people that you know run the casino know that this works and so people will keep putting money into those slot machines and they'll keep pulling that lever waiting for the you know three fruits to line up 
will be this time. Will be the next time. And they just keep going because they don't know when it's going to happen for them. Um, there are many applications of operant conditioning. I mean, we use it all the time, right, to, to sort of control people's behavior. Like in, in this, you know, in your classes at school, you're, you know, what's reinforcing you to, um, I don't know, to do what your professor says. It's, it's you know, like getting, getting an A or, you know, not getting an F. But those are all, that's all operant conditioning. You know, when your boss praises you for doing something, that's operant conditioning. When your boss pays you for doing something, that's that's operant conditioning. And you keep doing that behavior in order to get those rewards or avoid the punishers. Um, and so the punishers would be like somebody being mad at you, uh, telling you off, raking you across the coals. Those are all um, positive punishments. <laughs> And then negative punishments could be sort of taking something away. Like if you if you do poorly in school, you get sort of suspended for a while, right? There's academic probation. People can be suspended from work without pay. You're not allowed to to go in anymore. Um, and animals can be trained to do things that they wouldn't normally do using the principles of of operant conditioning. Rats don't want to push levers. Um, you know, dogs don't shake hands, uh, you know, cats don't use toilets without some kind of a training or like seals don't, I don't know, dance on on beach balls. And the way animal trainers do that is using a method called successive approximation. And so to get the rat to push the lever, you would reinforce it for at first for just, let's say, being on the right side of the side of the cage that has the lever in it. Okay, then it will spend more time on that side of the cage. And then you only reinforce it for being, say, within a few paces of the lever. And then I'll spend more time hanging around the lever. And eventually you only reinforce it if it's right up close to the lever. Okay. And then once it learns that, you um, only reinforce it for pushing the lever or for touching it, say, sniffing it, touching it, engaging it, and then only for pushing it down. So it takes a while to get the rat to push a lever. That's using the method of, of successive approximation. Chaining is that you can teach um, a, an animal to do things in, in a certain order. Um, you can encourage behavior by reinforcing it with the chance to engage in an activity that you like. So what Premack discovered with monkeys is that activities can be a reinforcer. Reinforcers don't have to be food. Right? They can be activities the animal enjoys engaging in. And one might be social activity. And so one punishment that we use is taking people out of social situations, right? grounding you to give people like social engagement. And so if you wanted to use this principle on yourself, um, you could say, well, I like watching Netflix, but I'm not going to allow myself to do that until I have gotten two hours of studying. It. Once you do that, you can reinforce, you can reward yourself with watching Netflix. Token economies are another example. And we see this kind of token economy with kind of vulnerable populations, people who are under your power so that you can design and administer the system. So children in the home, children at school, clinical settings, inpatients, right? people in hospital, people in jail. And the idea is that they have, you define what good behavior and bad behavior is. And if they have good behavior, you give them points, you know, or stars or stickers. And um, if they collect enough points, then they can get something they want, right? They can trade it in for a toy or an activity, an outing, um, more TV time, something at the prison store. 
And um, they use something called secondary reinforcers. So if you are working to get points, because you know that the points can be traded in for something you want, then the thing you want is the primary reinforcer and the points or the stars or the stickers are the secondary reinforcers. Money is a secondary reinforcer. Money is very, re very reinforcing. People do things for money, but it's not about those paper bills or numbers on pixels on, on a screen, right? It's, it's about what you can trade that in for. And those are the, the primary reinforcers. So secondary and reinforcers can certainly uh, work. There's a, a strategy for treatment in autism called um, applied behavior analysis that's based on um, operant conditioning to try to help people to communicate more effectively. Here are the, the key differences between operant and classical conditioning. In classical conditioning, the target behavior is something automatic. With Pavlov's and the dogs, it was salivation. Salivation, the unconditioned response, is an automatic response. In operant conditioning, the target behavior, pushing the lever, studying, going to work, is something that the organism emits voluntarily, right? The rat kind of decides to push the lever you decide to go to work or study, okay? It's not like a, a, a reflex. In classical conditioning, the behavior, the response, is a function of stimuli that, that precede, it says the behavior, but I think maybe that it, it should, should say the response. So in, in classical conditioning, the animal that is salivating to the tone does it because the tone predicts the food, which is the reinforcer. So the behavior is a function of a stimuli that, that is predictive. We're responding, we're salivating to the tone because the tone predicts the delivery of, of food. The, the stimuli forecasts the thing we want, and so the behavior is a response to some stimuli that precedes the reinforcer. With operant conditioning, it's about the consequences of the behavior. You do that behavior because it will get you something you want, right? Or it will, you don't do that behavior in order to avoid something that you don't want. It's about consequences. It's about something that comes after. And now I'm, I'm thinking that that's actually correct because the behavior in the case of, of classical conditioning is, is an automatic response of salivation. And you did that in response to something that happened, like a tone. Because you get tone and then salivation. And then in operant conditioning, it's about whatever is going to happen after the voluntary behavior. This depends on the function of your autonomic nervous system. This doesn't require consciousness. You can classically condition a sea slug. You can classically condition uh, caterpillars. And something that's really amazing about caterpillars is that they still keep that learning after they have... Um, metamorphosized it's like they dissolve and get rebuilt into a butterfly and the butterfly remembers that's amazing but that doesn't require um consciousness um or like explicit memory uh here's an example there was a patient who had wasn't able to form new memories so she uh the doctor would come in talk to her and then afterwards she wouldn't remember that anymore and he would shake her hand. And she didn't hesitate to shake his hand. But one day, he put a, he concealed a thumbtack in his hand. And so when she shook his hand, she got, um, she got hurt by the tack. 
doesn't sound very nice. But what happened after this was that next time he came in, and she can't remember anything, um, and he went to offer her his hand, she hesitated. But she couldn't explicitly remember anything. And that shows that the, the conditioning takes place at, at some automatic level. It is different for operant conditioning, which depends on, on the somatic nervous system. Um, the, the somatic nervous system is a part of your nervous system that controls voluntary behavior. So my, my heart is beating right now and I can't be like, stop beating. It doesn't work because it's under the control of my autonomic nervous system. But if I move my hand, um, that's voluntary behavior is under the control of the somatic nervous system. And operant conditioning um, involves a bit more cognition, right? Like it, it depends on on the animal's interpretation of um, of the behavior or of the, of the response. So, let me give you an example. Um, if you get a B on your exam. That could be a reward or a punishment, depending on on your interpretation. See, there's more of a role for sort of consciousness and, and awareness. If you're used to getting Fs and Ds and you get a B, you're like, yay! And maybe that's a rewarding experience for you. But uh, if you're used to to getting A's, getting, getting a B could feel like a slap in the face. So there's more of a role for, for cognition in operant conditioning. Operant conditioning and classical conditioning can be combined. The two process theory of anxiety argues that anxiety, uh, that phobias begin with classical conditioning. So if a dog bites you, you learn to be afraid of dogs, right? You associate the pain of being bitten with dogs. But then that fear is maintained through avoidance. And avoidance is about negative reinforcement. You stay away from dogs, right? Because when you're around a dog, you're sort of punished by that feeling of anxiety. But if you cross the street, get away from the dog, um, then you're being reinforced for your fearful behavior by that decrease in anxiety, right? Feel relieved. Hey, that, that negative stimulus of, of the fear is, is taken away through the avoidance. And then phobias are maintained through avoidance. Um, I'll, I think I'll, next lecture, we can talk about the, the role of, of cognition in, in learning. Um, are there any any questions about the, the lecture today? What do you think of my friend's idea that a lot of behavior is maintained on negative reinforcement schedule? You keep going to work to avoid getting fired. Not because you really like going to work. And he, he also argued that procrastination is, is maintained on a negative reinforcement schedule. If you don't like studying, you could avoid it. Till then at the last minute, you're like, oh no, I'm gonna fail if I don't study or write this paper. And that's worse. And so you engage in the studying or the writing, the paper writing, not because you like studying or, or you like writing papers, but to, to avoid failing it. Um, and there's a, a question, would that not be the same as the fear factor and the dog? I'm not, I don't understand the question.
Yeah. So the the fear of the dog is being maintained through negative reinforcement. The avoidance is reinforced because you don't get the the, the fearful stimuli. So you're avoiding. Yeah, avoiding studying would be by procrastinating would be the same. And the procrastination isn't just about avoiding the the, the stimuli you don't like. When you're not studying, you can also do something like watch Netflix that you do like. So it's also being positively reinforced. Oh, yes. Um, you were asking about your friends. Like I think they're both examples of, of negative reinforcement. And then he suggests that you could change the reinforcement schedule by studying earlier. So if you started studying earlier, um, and this has happened to me, you might find that it, you know, it's not so bad. Maybe the textbook's kind of interesting. And then you could be reinforced by, by the pleasure in that activity. Start doing it earlier, and then also get better grades, and then you can kind of switch the reinforcement schedule on yourself. All right, we are at 1020, and um, I'm going to stop the recording and hang out in case there's any other questions. <laughs>